So our presenter tonight, uh, for those of you with Delta Sigma Theta, uh, you are going to be uh, familiar with her. And there she is on camera. I'm going to embarrass her a little bit while I talk about her here. Um, this is uh, Sonia Dennis Hart. She is the manager for the Heart Failure Program for the Greater Charlotte Market, Market at Nivon Health. She manages four uh, teams at four hospitals and five clinics. No wonder you're tired today. I got you, girl. I feel ya. Uh, she's responsible for decreasing readmission rates for heart failure patients at the hospitals and making sure that Navant is on the cutting edge of finding new treatments for heart failure patients. She attended Clemson University and received a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. She has been in healthcare for 25 years. I know, she doesn't look like it, does she? Uh, she just had a birthday, too. Should we sing happy birthday to you? You just had a big birthday. No, I won't sing. Okay. Most people pay me to sing, but I won't sing. Um, she's been in healthcare for 25 years, working in cardiac research, case management, and cardiac nursing. She's also been, been appointed to the American Heart Association Southeast Heart Advisory Committee. And um, she is committed to public service and being a healthcare advocate to patients that cannot advocate for themselves. Isn't that what we talk about in the Red Heart Mamas all the time? That we have got to advocate for ourselves. She has served as past president of the Rock Hill Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta. She is the current vice president and programming chair of the Piedmont Black Nurses Association and also a member of the National Black Nurses Association. I love this part. In her free time, <laughs> notice she's laughing too. In her free time, she enjoys reading, shopping, dancing, and traveling with her husband, Victor. Welcome. Thank you so much. You can unmute Ms. Sonia and say hello to everybody. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Sheila, for that warm introduction. Can everybody hear me okay before we get started any further? Perfect. You, you sound right. wonderful. You sound <laughs> wonderful. And we still have some ladies joining us here on Zoom. Just a reminder for everybody, to, other than Sonia, to keep your cameras and uh, mute so that we can do the presentation. So, Sonia, I am so glad, and I, and I love your introduction. I, You and I chatted, and you're like, oh, it's been a long day. And I'm like, I feel you. But after reading that, I'm going, whew, when do you sleep? When do you sleep? <laughs> Um, that was one of my things for 2020 is to make self-care priority and sleep is at the top of my list. So I try really hard to um, try to get at least six to seven hours of sleep a night. So I'm a early bird. So I typically go to bed probably around 930 or 10 most nights. <laughs> Me too. Nine o'clock. I can't even put a sentence together. I'm I'm done. I'm up with the chickens and I go to bed with the chickens, as my grandma used to say. And And I'm glad you mentioned self-care. Because, um, as you know, and, and you serve on uh, some uh, advisor committees as well, and uh, the conversations that we've been having nationally has really come back to self-care. And part of that self-care, of course, begins with heart care. The better we take care of our hearts, it takes care of the rest of us. But what we're seeing are some really disturbing trends, especially when it comes to blood pressure, which is a preventable risk factor for heart disease, certainly it can be managed. But we're seeing some really frightening trends when it comes to even younger women with hypertension. We're also seeing because of the two years of a pandemic that blood pressure is out of control. It isn't being controlled. And um, physicians are really taking a look at this and trying to help people understand how they can manage their blood pressure at home, which I think is critically important. And so I am thrilled that you are gonna be presenting this tonight. I'm gonna to take care of your slide deck and share the screen. So I'm gonna go away, ladies, everybody on Facebook Live, please welcome Sonia and give her your attention. She's got some great information for you. So as Sheila stated in the beginning, um, we are talking about how to manage your high blood pressure at home. So um, I will preface this by saying I am not an MD. I am an RN though. And as she said earlier, I do have 25 years of nursing experience, most of it in cardiac health. So um, 
I don't consider myself an expert by any means, but have been around it enough to know to kind of tell you the basics of, of how to treat your blood pressure. Next slide, please. So let's start with what is a blood pressure. So blood pressure really is the blood pushing against the walls of your arteries and your arteries carry blood, which is your oxygenated blood or the clean blood um, from your heart to other parts of the body. So your arteries are very, very important. Um, high blood pressure then is when also called hypertension is when your blood pressure is above the guideline of 130 over 80. And this is probably a little difficult to see, but I just wanted to kind of show you um, what normal ranges of blood pressure look like and what hypertension looks like, because hypertension is what we're going to really kind of focus on with this talk. Um, next slide, please. So some interesting facts about hypertension, I'm not gonna read all of these to you, but I do want to point out, um, which I think is now changing with the information that is currently coming out, but this information for, was from like 2017. And a great percentage of men, 50% have high blood, high blood pressure more than women. I think we're tipping the scale now and it's probably about 50-50 and it could be um, a little bit more with women having it more than men these days. Um, hypertension, of course, is more common in the African-American community than our counterparts. And most of the time, there are no obvious symptoms. So any of us could be walking around right now with hypertension and not know that we have it, unless we're doing what we're supposed to do um, to know our numbers and taking care of ourselves. Next slide, please. So, Controlling your blood pressure is easier said than done. There are a couple of things, steps here that I'm going to share with you. Know your numbers. And when I say know your numbers, what that means is um, get an appointment with your primary care doctor, um, have them take your blood pressure so you know what your baseline is, um, and make sure that with that, um, you understand what those numbers mean. Secondly, work with your doctor. If you do happen to have high blood pressure, your doctor will come up with a medical plan to help lower those numbers. Sometimes you can do it with just diet. Other times you can do it with diet and medication. Both help. So I always tell patients to always do what the doctor says, even when they don't feel like it's necessary. Step three, make a few lifestyle changes. Maintain a healthy weight. Eat healthier reduce sodium, get active, and limit alcohol. That all sounds easy in theory, right? But what I will tell you, even if you were to lose just, if you are considered overweight now, if you were to lose at least five to 10 pounds, it will make a noticeable difference in your blood pressure, especially if you're diagnosed with hypertension. And we all know that sodium is one of the main culprits of why we have hypertension. And I'll talk more about that um, in some later slides. Um, keep checking your blood pressure at home. We'll also talk about how you can monitor that at home as well. And lastly, take your medication as prescribed. Next slide, please. So we're gonna start with talking about diet. So there are lots of diets out there, um, lots of heart healthy diets out there. Typically um, for other patients, we recommend a Mediterranean diet, which really provides a lot of variety in your food, but really focuses on fruits and vegetables. But for this presentation, I wanted to talk about the DASH diet because it's actually a diet to help with hypertension. And what DASH stands for is Diet Approaches to Stop Hypertension. It includes foods that are rich in potassium and calcium and magnesium. Those nutrients actually help control our blood pressure. And it also limit, it limits your sodium. So we typically eat way more than a teaspoon of table salt a day in our meals. This diet will help you learn how to eat a teaspoon of table salt. Next slide, please. So what is included in a DASH diet? So as you can see here is all of the things that we talked about earlier, grains, vegetables, fat-free or low-fat dairy products, lean meats, um, poultry and fish. And I will say, um, as I myself actually have a seafood allergy, and so lean meats are kind of hard to come by for me. So I will often tell my patients that can't tolerate 
fish for whatever reason. Um, stick with your chickens, lean cuts of chicken um, and turkey is a good alternative to um, fish if you can't have it. And also nut seeds and legumes, which we also call beans, are also a great source of protein as well. And as you can see there, you can have four to five servings a week of that um, per week. What I want to kind of center for on this particular slide too is vegetables. As you see there, it says four to five servings a day. And I'm sure a lot of people are like, well, how do you get that in if you're only eating three meals a day? So what I would say to you is, um, I'll share, for example, what I typically do um, to try to incorporate all my vegetables. When you look at my plate, for the most part, I try to make my plate look like a quadrant, so I cut it into fours. So 25% of my plate is typically protein, about 50% of my plate is vegetables, and then 25% are grains. And when I talk about grains, you will talk about your healthier grains like whole wheat bread, um, Quinoa is a good source of grains, um, brown rice, and I'm not a fan of brown rice either, but it is an acquired taste and it gets better if you keep eating it. So those are just some tips to talk about the things that are included in the DASH diet. Next slide, please. So here are some other cooking tips that you will find useful um, in trying to change your lifestyle. Um, use sodium-free spices instead of salt. Um, do not add salt when cooking pasta, rice, or hot cereal. And I know growing up in the South, especially in the Low Country region, region we always um, flavored our water to boil our rice with salt. So you have to learn how to um, relearn those habits. Um, choose fresh or frozen skinless poultry fish and lean cuts of meat, and make sure that you read the back of food labels. It's so important to make sure that you're looking at that sodium when you're buying things. I typically, um, when I do educate patients, I try to tell them, especially with vegetables, try to stay away from canned vegetables. They have probably the most sodium, so it's probably best for you to get um, fresh vegetables or frozen vegetables. Next slide, please. So water, water is huge um, and not only for hypertension, but also just healthy in general. So a basic formula for your water intake is to divide your total weight by two. And that is how many ounces of water you should drink in a day. Um, some tips for water is to try to drink your water 10 minutes before eating or 30 minutes after eating. I know a lot of people like to drink during their meals, but if you have some digestive issues, that tip helps with the bloating. And you try to finish your water before two hours before you go to bed so you won't be up all night. Um, that is my tip, especially personally. Um, it does work when you stop your water two hours before you go to bed. Next slide, please. So we're going to get into now of how to take your blood pressure. I actually did not bring a cuff with me, but I just want to kind of give you some basic tips about blood pressure. So the first thing I will tell you, if you have a cuff, cuff at home, be it an electronic, and I see some of my nurse friends on the page, they probably have a manual cuff with a stethoscope. Um, the first thing I would suggest that you do, especially if you have a new cuff, is take that with you when you go see your physician or primary care provider. What that does is it allows them to calibrate your monitor against what they're reading in the office. So when you do start taking your blood pressure at home, you will have a good baseline of what that looks like. So um, when you're taking your blood pressure, try to make sure that you wrap it around your arm above your elbow, probably like one or two inches above your elbow. Be really, really still when you take it. And I would suggest a lot of times to make sure that it's at a calm time of day for you. You don't wanna take it when you have just rushed in from a full day of work, you're tired. That is not a good time to take your blood pressure. Um, I would probably suggest when you're taking it at home, it's probably to take it in the mornings when you're the most calm and then just track it and try to take it at the same time every day so you can see the consistency and see any patterns that may develop there. 
my other suggestion about uh, monitoring your blood pressure at home, do not become alarmed if you see some abnormal numbers one or two days. Um, I would be more concerned if you see that pattern on for maybe a week or so, then that is the time to call your doctor to say, hey, these are my numbers. Should I come in? Should we adjust some medications? So that's what I would tell you about um, taking your blood pressure and monitoring it at home. Next slide. I think I'm going through these really quick. <laughs> so I did, but I want to open it, the floor up for any questions that you may have. Um, I know that was really quick, but um, I think us, especially as Black women, we need to be very mindful of um, self-care, as Sheila said earlier, and things that keep us calm and how we can preserve ourselves to take care of ourselves so we can pour into other people. Thank you. That is a lot of great information. It really is. And and um, I'm going to, I've got somebody else I'm admitting here. So I'll, I'll kick it off with, with a question. Now, I noticed on the graphic that you had for normal blood pressure, because a few years ago, they up the normal blood pressure, then they lower the normal blood pressure. So what is normal blood pressure? What's the so, number? I will say to you that really, in my opinion, it depends on the person. So I, the reason I say that is because typically the last numbers that I looked at from the American Heart Association was like 120 over 80. But mm -hmm. I will tell you from experience, my mom could not tolerate a blood pressure of 120 over 80. It made her very sluggish. She just did not do well. So a normal blood pressure for her was 140 over 70, and she was fine with that. So I think that's why it's very important to have conversations with your doctor to, to determine what is normal for you, because um, they have those, what we call them, guidelines. So it doesn't mean that everybody is going to fit that mm -hmm. into that box. Well, and, and we know that as we age, you know, what is considered normal for senior adults is different than women at our age, for right. example. And and that is very good, you know, to remember. And I know, you know, with, with my mom, for example, or my husband, uh, they would rather have it perhaps a little bit higher range for a senior adult, because if it gets too low, they're worried about a fall. Right. So that's, Exactly right. Having that conversation with your doctor so you know what your normal would be. Um, and, and again, if anybody um, else has any questions either on Facebook Live or for the folks here on Zoom with us, feel free to unmute. Come on camera if you would like to raise your hand. We'll be happy to recognize you. Uh, Stephanie in the chat says, I am salt sensitive. My blood pressure goes up with salt. I buy no salt canned foods now, fresh and uh, sorry, fresh and frozen veggies and read labels. Good for you. Um, over 120, over 80. I have headaches. Everyone is different. Yes, I will tell you that. And, and my cardiologist, um, we were having a conversation about blood pressure and he was saying, well, you know, it's, it's called the silent killer. Because most people don't have symptoms and they don't know that they have high blood pressure until they get this crazy reading. And it's like, oh, my gosh, you have high blood pressure. I actually get when my blood pressure is off, I know it. I get a headache and it feels like I'm a teapot about to go, boo, you know, and so I know the headache that I get from it. But not everybody does. So right. how would a person know? I guess this is like hypertension 101, but how does a person know if they have high blood pressure? So again, it goes back to that slide where I say know your numbers. So it's very important to have a baseline of what your blood pressure is. And so it's so important as we as women to make sure that we have a um, healthcare provider that can take our blood pressures initially to know what those are, and then they can treat those accordingly. So that would be the best advice I would give you. Typically, um, I will say with heart patients that I have dealt with before, they typically get referred to our office from their primary care office because they've been having headaches and they've done everything that they could think of to try to get rid of the headache and it's still there. And typically when they take their blood pressure, it's high. 
And once you get that blood pressure regulated, either with diet or with diet and medication, the headache goes away. So to recap, what we do for our bodies and what we put into our bodies really does make a difference because if you become dehydrated, for example, you you mentioned drinking water. Mm -hmm. That can make your blood pressure go up. Um, What we eat, I mean, if you eat out a lot, Mm -hmm. boy, that's (laughs) sodium. And I'm talking about things I learned the hard way. You know, if if a restaurant, I, I believe if a restaurant chain has 15 restaurants, they have to provide uh, their nutrition information. So it's not just the labels on the packages that you're buying, and that goes for frozen foods too, um, or canned foods, but it's also if you eat out in restaurants. Um, I remember one time there was a particular item I really liked, and I thought, well, it's pretty healthy. It's got a lot of protein in it, tastes really good. I'm not eating a big portion. But when I looked up the amount of sodium in that one little container, I went, holy moly, that's like almost half of my sodium for the whole day. That doesn't leave me a whole lot of wiggle room. So um, how do people, I know when you're working with heart failure patients, especially, Mm -hmm. I mean, that that sodium issue is huge. How, How do you help them kind of get past that? Because salt and sugar both are something that, it takes a while to change your palate to get used to not having it. So how do you get through that? So what I tell patients is baby steps. So, and I'm a work in progress myself. If I want a cookie, I'm going to have a cookie. Um, (laughs) But I know that I can't have a cookie every day. And so what I tell my patients, especially those that really like to eat out all the time or eat those high sodium items like fries and um, fast foods is choose one day a week that you're going to do that. and don't overdo it when you do. Um, and then you have to change your portion sizes. Like if you go to McDonald's or Burger King or whatever, you can't have the Whopper. Try the Whopper Junior or the cheeseburger. Tastes the same, just not as much. Um, so uh, <laughs> portion size is very important. And like I said, baby steps. Um, sometimes um, patients are very frustrated because it's hard for them to. Um, access fresh foods or frozen foods because they're more expensive. So the other thing I will tell them at the time, if you can afford canned goods, get the low sodium brand of that and then just rinse them off Mm -hmm. before you put them in the microwave. That helps. So just little things like that. Oh, absolutely. Even if I use canned vegetables to put in a stew or chili, I rinse everything. Just, Mm -hmm. you know, rinse it really, really well. But uh, for some people that live in areas with food deserts and, you know, there's not a grocery store really close and the only thing they can get, you know, canned and you have a lot of the processed food and boxed foods, um, you know, you just have to be really conscious about what you're eating. But rinsing is is a good tip if, if that's what's in your budget or if that's what's accessible. Some vegetables vegetables are better than no vegetables. So rinsing. Um <laughs> Uh, Sherry in the chat says, I was told I have hereditary high blood pressure. My weight is well maintained. I exercise, eat well, drink lots of water, and still have to take a water pill. Should I just expect a lifetime of high blood pressure meds? Um, I thought with all the good measures I put in place, I could come off. Now, I know you and I aren't doctors, so this is not medical advice, but what would you tell uh, Sherry? What I would tell Sheree is um, even with uh, the maintaining of the weight and doing all of the right things, because you do have the hereditary part of that, it probably is going to stick with you. But what I can tell you, and because I do have patients that um, come in and have that same issue, um, it gets better over time and eventually they can decrease your dose. So you may not ever be completely free of it, but a lower dose is much better than having to take the max dose of a blood pressure medication. Or you become a heart attack survivor and you get to take two a day. (laughs) So don't do that. Prevention, stay on this side of it. Um, it. Yeah, Nigel says, what does it mean if the bottom number stays slightly higher than the norm, but the top stays good? 
So what I will say to that is I would just have them monitor your bottom number more carefully. And like I said, it really just depends on how it affects you as a person. So if you're not mm -hmm. having like the headaches or anything else with it and they're okay with the bottom number being a little bit higher, um, I would just say continue to monitor it. A lot of times what I will tell you is um, most medical professionals are really concerned about that top number. We don't like to see numbers like 150, 160. That's cause for concern. And if we get to like 200, then, you know, we're probably going to wheel you immediately to the ED um, to make sure that we get that under control because those numbers are dangerously high and we don't want you to um, have the risk of having a stroke or something of that nature. Absolutely. And, and I appreciate when you were talking about um, Checking your blood pressure at home. Um, the Heart to Heart Foundation has just been added as a partner with the Office on Wo Women's Health for the self-monitored uh, blood pressure program. And being on the Heart Truth uh, as, as a partner, you know, we've had those, uh, those conversations, too, about um, more and more measuring our blood pressure at home and what they have found. And, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little grassroots organization sitting there with all these national organizations uh, on these roundtable calls. And what the doctors are now saying is that, especially with the pandemic the last two years, mm -hmm. people aren't going in to get their blood pressure checked. And I think it has finally occurred to everyone to ask us as patients to take off work or schedule an appointment, pay for a copay to go in to have our blood pressure checked, especially as women, we're not doing it. You know, we might stop and, and do something at a, at a store, but as far as coming in, it's just not convenient. Plus we're having to pay. Or if you run in just to get your blood pressure checked, there's no conversation with the doctor. So the, there's a disconnect in helping us manage our blood pressure. So the move to really teach people how to measure and monitor and manage your blood pressure at home is key to helping us do that because the trends, as you know, that we're seeing when it comes to uncontrolled blood pressure across the country, especially among women, the numbers are scary. So what I would like for you to do, because I know we're talking about this, what happens when people don't control their blood pressure? You know, physically, what happens to our heart when we just don't stay on top of this? So as I mentioned in that very first slide when we were talking about our arteries, those are so important because like I said, that brings the clean blood from your heart and distributes it to your body. So let's say we are ignoring or not doing proper care as far as checking our blood pressure or knowing what our numbers are. So your arteries eventually have build plaque builder. So that slows down the amount of blood that actually gets through to your body parts. And there are several things that could happen with uncontrolled hypertension. Like you said earlier, you could have an MI, a heart attack. Um, you could have a stroke. Um, a lot of people, especially women, we don't typically have chest pain like regular people. It could be like a toothache or um, your arm is hurting and you ignore that. And then you could actually be, you know, in a serious situation. And what, what it buys you is a ticket to the hospital to see my team um, and possibly end up with what we call um, a stent or a um, heart cath to see what's going on. And if it's really bad, like let's say all the major vessels in your heart are not good, you could end up with what we call a um, bypass surgery, which means that they have to find grafts to put into those arteries for it to open up so you have blood flow and ultimately if you really ignore it and wait too late and just finally after the headache or whatever and it's been months or whatever possibly death if you if you don't monitor it like you're supposed to you know and, and we referred to it earlier as the silent killer and mm -hmm. and that's the reason why is you know it's really scary sonia that most people especially women don't even know that they have heart disease. They don't know that they have high blood pressure until it's almost too late. 65% of women 
who die of a heart attack did report any previous symptoms. They were probably there. It's just we're really good at checking WebMD mm-hmm. <laughs> or, you know, ignoring it or blaming it on something else. And we've got to really stop doing that. Um, but here's a question, a question from Tiffany. She asks, do you have a recommendation for the most accurate blood pressure cuff for home use? I know there's like a whole list out there. It is of, a whole list. Yeah. What I would probably advise Tiffany is I'm an Amazon shopper. (laughs) Which is Amazon smile. (laughs) Which is really um convenient. And what I would say is go to Amazon and look at the I always look at the reviews of things and see what people actually say they use the products and then kind of go from there. I would say probably about 80% of the blood pressure cuffs on the market now are pretty reliable, not back when I would say the early 2000s, so you probably have more trouble, but now they're uh, pretty reliable. That's why I say when you get the blood pressure cuff, whatever type you choose to get, go to your healthcare provider so they can calibrate it and make sure it's measuring what they measure in the the office. Absolutely. And uh, we're going to be adding to our website, the hearttoheartfoundation.org, uh, I believe Million Hearts um, through the CDC, they actually did a study on the best blood pressure cuffs that they're recommending that you use for self-monitoring at home. And uh, we're going to put that on our website. We just had this conversation yesterday. So I'm going to get it on our website. And when we do, I'll send it out through email and um, everybody who registered for this talk on uh, Zoom, you'll get that. You'll get that list too. So we'll make sure we get that list to you. Um, Crystal wants to know, hmm, what do you think about the heart apps on the fitness watches? Um, I will say from a medical professional standpoint, I think they are good. Um, I would not say use that in place of a medical professional, but if you do see something abnormal or you're watch beeps at you for a reason, watch the trends, especially if you're not currently having symptoms. I do know um, I wear a Fitbit quite often, and when I'm exercising, my heart rate does get up higher than normal, and it's going to beep. But I also know that when I cool down, I'm probably going to get back to my base rate. So it's really about knowing your body and knowing um, what are good ranges for you. Um, I haven't, we're actually doing a project right now um, at work about remote patient monitoring. So we will actually have patients that will have iPads at home that we will um, have connected to scales and blood pressure cuffs that are Bluetooth operated. So follow up with me in about six months and I can be able to tell you if we really think the technology is accurate. (laughs) I I think that's such a great program. And, you know, part of our conversation yesterday, I want to say there was 30 organizations and we were one of those uh, having this, the same conversation is that especially in the rural communities or among our lower income neighborhoods that don't have access to you know, the internet and the Bluetooth of, of trying to help them um, monitor and report, <clears throat> you know, their, their blood pressure. And not only that, but some, some of our senior population, I mean, we've got them to use email and Facebook, right? Right. But teaching them to do this is, is yet another hurdle, but there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of challenges there, but I think it's moving in, you know, the right direction so that we can, you know, collect that data. Uh, speaking of data, you and I talked about this before we began the program. Um, there's a report that came out today, and this just really, uh, you know, it really concerned me. Um, we know that among our African American uh, community, that we have among the women, um, we lose fifty thousand African American women to heart disease every year. 50,000. That would be like if we took all of the women age 20 and older, African-American women in York, Chester, and Lancaster counties, and they all died that year Mm -hmm. from heart disease, from a largely preventable disease. And high blood pressure Mm -hmm. is one of the main risk factors among African-American women. Um, The other statistic that I read this week was that 
for African American women aged 20, 20 and older. We should be the healthiest in our lives in our 20s and 30s. But 20 and older, half, half already have heart disease. These numbers are just frightening. And across the board in the United States of America in the year 2022, when we can almost wave a wand over people like Star Trek and tell what's wrong with them, right? There was a report that came out today, Sonia, that said between the ages, I believe, 20 and 40, women of childbearing years, most of them, their hearts are not healthy enough for pregnancy. If, if a woman has had preeclampsia during a pregnancy, that's going to put her at higher risk of a heart attack later on. If she began her period at a young age, if she finished menopause early, those things are all red flags for heart disease. I mean, we're talking about young women whose hearts aren't healthy enough for pregnancy, and we're having heart issues in pregnancy and postpartum. So how do we, as older women, okay, I just turned 60, right? We have five kids. We have 11 grandchildren. So our daughters are, you know, are, are all grown women now in their 30s and older. How do we get this message to younger women that if we don't start taking care of our heart health at a very young age, we're not going to be here to see our children and grandchildren grow up. Right. And when I say to that, um, Sheila, one of the most important things that we as women have is having other women to talk to, encourage those type of things. I think your organization is a great organization that um, brings women together so they can share their stories. You can get information out there. Um, I, I always say have a sister circle. It is mm -hmm. really important to have people that you trust. And sometimes they can persuade you to do things that you don't want to do. I'll share a personal story. Um, in my 40s, or right before I turned 40, um, most of my adult life, my periods were very, very heavy um, and just unbearable. Um, mm -hmm. So much so I was afraid to wear white at any time because I never knew what was going to happen. And so I just dealt with this. Um, myself and did not share. So one day I was talking to one of my colleagues at work and was sharing my story about, you know, how painful my periods are, whatever, what have you. And she was like, you need to go and be evaluated and see if you can have surgery. Like, want to have surgery? I'm, you know, late 30s, about 340 or whatever. But she kept on me about that. And because she did, I did go see my OB. We ran some tests, comes to find out I had fibroids, um, and we could go about a couple of ways of getting rid of them. I chose to have surgery, life-changing for me, um, and I'm now able to wear white and not have anxiety about mm -hmm. it. So when I say all of that to say, when you have those concerns, whether it's mental concerns or health concerns, emotional concerns, talk to somebody that you trust even if it's not your sister circle, um, a professional or whoever, and have them make sure that you're following your health plan like you're supposed to. In everything you do, there's an understanding of the greater good. And that greater good ain't always you or the people in this company. It's really the communities where we live every day. We're here for the greater good of the community, not just the survival of this business. Absolutely. And, you know, and with our with our Red Heart Mamas group, that's what we want women to understand. First of all, you need to know your risk factors. You need to know your personal risk for heart disease and how you can win the fight against our number one killer. And then you need to, armed with that information, share it with the women in your life. Advocate for yourself. Advocate for others, because if we don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. Um, Neokia, and I may be mispronouncing your name, I'm sorry, in the chat says, my blood pressure today at the time of my doctor's visit was 136 over 86. I'm trying to keep it regulated after a major surgery last week. Oh, hope you're feeling better. 
Uh, when I was in the hospital, it was great because they removed the issue that was contributing to the high blood pressure. Um, she said, now I'm back on my BP meds and my outreach nurse wants me to monitor my high blood pressure uh, more than I'm trying to scroll down and see if I can see the rest of her comment here. Um, it's kind of going on there. I can see it. Um, you can see it. Uh, oh, a fibroid removed. That was part of her high blood pressure program and it was right. pressing on her arteries. Oh my goodness. So what I'm gonna say to Naoki is this, sis, go to Amazon when we get off this call and order you a cuff. And because mm -hmm. I know you personally, if I need to come visit you to actually calibrate your cuff for you, <laughs> I'll be more than happy to do that. So um, reach out to me um, after this is over. <laughs> I, you know, and, and things like that where you don't think about those connections, but definitely connected. Um, I appreciated one thing that uh, that you said earlier when you were talking about, you know, monitoring your blood pressure at home. Um, and, and I've run into this before and, you know, we've all done a lot of health fairs and before COVID, uh, we would have teams that would go out and, and do the biometric screenings and, and the blood pressure readings. And I, I would always get tickled at the people who would go to one table to get their blood pressure checked. And then they'd go to another table to get their blood pressure checked and they're comparing the two. Or they would check their blood pressure at 8 a.m. and then they check their blood pressure at 2, 8, at 2 p.m. and just freak out because it's like, oh my gosh, they're so different. But our blood pressure fluctuate, fluctuates through the day, doesn't it? It does. And that's why I said in the presentation that I always take it around the same time every day. That way you can track it better. Because um, mm -hmm. when you do take it at different times of the day, you could have, you know, gotten out of just gotten out of a stressful meeting or just had an argument with your spouse. Anything could precipitate those factors to make those numbers different. So when you take it consistently and watch the patterns, that's when you have the conversation with your um, health care provider to see what's going on and why is this different. And I, and I appreciate you mentioning uh, the DASH eating plan. That is uh, the most recommended, you know, if you're trying to control your, your high blood pressure. And if they go to the heart to heart foundation, uh, dot org and click on resources, we have a full cache of, uh, of DASH eating plan information there that, uh, that you can, you can download. One thing we didn't mention, um, that we probably should is that, you know, you can't, um, you can't out exercise a bad diet. So we, we got to be careful what we put in our bodies. But having said that, exercise is still one of the best ways. And you mentioned um, we, we've got to get out there and get moving. And you mentioned you like to dance. Yes. Yes. I do. And I would say this, that one of the best things that I actually did for myself back in 2020 was to make time, to make a plan. So every day, mostly during the week, I am going to try to get at least 20 to 30 minutes of exercise in, whether it's um, cardiac exercise, such as doing a video or walking on the treadmill or when it's warm outside, walking outside. It is important for me to make sure that I have that 20 to 30 minutes of fitness. Um, it makes a difference. You just feel better when you work out. I won't say it does also help with weight loss, not as much as your diet, but it does those endorphins and feeling better. It can change your whole mood, it's particularly if you've had a rough day and you exercise in the evenings. I'm typically want to do it in the morning so I can get it over with. So um, <laughs> I typically work out in the morning. But um, it does also help you start the day um, better when you have gotten that workout in. And and some of us can't exercise at night. I have one of those really rare conditions. It, it took my cardiologist a while to figure out that uh, when I exercise, uh, it, it drives a lot of... Um, endorphins or whatever the, the uh, adrenaline mm -hmm. right and so if I do that at night I'm up mm -hmm. till like 12 <laughs> I can't go to sleep because right. I've got just so much going on so I have to do it in the morning um, we have a question I take a low dose blood pressure pill but I have heard that vinegar helps with lowering blood pressure is that true so I will say this um 
we often hear that, um, especially I, apple cider vinegar does help with blood pressure. But what I say, um, if you're on a blood pressure medicine, you're probably on it for a reason. So take the medicine that if you want to try the apple cider vinegar to see if it helps, I don't say not do it, but um, monitor it. Like I would probably say go a week of taking your blood pressure just with the medicine to see where you are. Then when you start taking the apple cider vinegar, if you notice a difference, then the next time you have a follow up with your physician or you can even call um, the office and speak to their nurse and just say, hey, I've started this and I've noticed a difference. They may even, you know, lower your dose to take you off of it. It just depends on um, what they think at the time. But we we cannot stress this enough. Never, ever, ever, ever <laughs> just stop taking your medication without right. your doctor telling you to do so. Because as you know, because you work with, with uh, cardiac rehabilitation pa patients, that yes. the readmissions is usually because mm -hmm. the patients stopped taking their medication and doing what they were told. Right. So don't stop taking your medication until the doctor tells you. Uh, Deborah writes in the chat, I have been on blood pressure, blood pressure medication for years. The last few years, my blood pressure has been normal. I do also have a blood pressure cup at home. So if my blood pressure is continually normal, <laughs> do I still need to take my medication? I think we just answered that. Absolutely. Yes, Deborah. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> my, my response to that would be schedule an appointment with your mm -hmm. healthcare provider. Let them know um, if you've been keeping track of that. Take all of that information with you and they can kind of determine your action plan from there. And more and more doctor's offices are doing the self-monitored blood pressure at home. They can put a halter monitor on you for a day or so just to see if everything is right. But it may be that your blood pressure is normal because you're taking your medications like you should. Right. So who knows if you come off of them, you know, it, it's really a catch 22. For, you know, it was a uh, Ben Franklin prevention is worth a pound of cure. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about prevention of the risk factors that lead to heart disease, especially high blood pressure, you know, that's got to begin in childhood. And one of the things that I think surprise a whole lot of people is that we have a whole lot of kids, a whole lot of children, I'm talking 10-year-olds, all the way up into their teens, who are on high blood pressure medication, who are already on that path. If we have children or grandchildren, or we know of some that are already struggling with hypertension, um, what can we do to help them? Um, I like you said, I think education is really important. I think we do a great disservice sometimes without um, educating our children about healthy eating and options are out there and um, what, you know, eating fast food does to your body. So um, I think a lot of that, if we could change some of the curriculums in school to really include health and those type pur purposes, um, to really talk about healthy eating and avoiding those things. If we did that earlier, I think children would probably have a better sense of health and would probably look at things differently. You know, when you talk about that and, and we mentioned that, I mean, 2,300 milligrams of sodium a day and you're talking about a teaspoon mm -hmm. and we're getting more than that. Mm -hmm. And you look at a child's, what we call the SAD diet, the SAD American diet, mm -hmm. that the standard American diet is just SAD. Um, mm -hmm. Not only the added sodium, but the uh, the added sugar that children yeah. are getting um, every single day between overly processed packaged foods, convenience foods, fast foods. Mm -hmm. um, and the food industry, you know, over the years, you, you just turned a magic number. So I'm a little older than you, but, you know, I remember when the first TV dinners came mm -hmm. out, you grow up, there wasn't fast food everywhere, much less at your school cafeteria. You, you didn't get that. That was a treat if you got burger and fries on a Saturday because you went into town. But now it's just every day. This is what our kids are being faced with uh, between what they eat and drink and with them really um sitting behind the TV or sitting behind video games on a regular basis, 
and the obesity rate. Uh, I shared with a group a couple of days ago, we were talking about helping our children understand how to eat better, that we have a lot of children in our nation who are obese, Mm -hmm. but they're undernourished because what they're eating does not nourish their bodies. So we're seeing prediabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol in our kids. Um, All right. So let me get back up there and find Janelle's comment. It said, my blood pressure is always high when I take it at home. Whenever I go to the doctors, it's really good. That's crazy because usually it's the opposite. Um, Is there a way I can calibrate my monitor myself or should I get a new one? It's about four to five years old. So my answer to that is take it with you the next time you have an appointment so they can kind of see, we can you can see what the differences are. And if it's still like way off, like theirs is like your blood pressure, maybe 130 over 80, but your cuff is reading like 150 over something else or 160, then it may be time for a new cuff. I, I would definitely check that out because technology has really changed and improved over mm-hmm. over the years. And again, we will put that list over on our website and I'll email it to everybody because uh, we were talking about that yesterday with, with uh, the uh, the folks with, Million Hearts had done a really good job on that. Stephanie made a comment in the chat. She said, we need to educate parents and school leaders, change the school diet, more plant-based food and recipes, more water, speak to food industry to reduce sugar, salts, and trans fats. Kids don't buy the food, schools and parents buy the food. Uh, That's an interesting comment. A few years ago, we did a project on the Fed Up film, dealing with sugar uh, with Katie Couric to get that program into schools nationally to try to educate parents and educators about how much added sugar, you know, are in the foods uh, that our kids are consuming. And it was really an eye opener for me to learn that, you know, our legislators, you know, at Congress, we're having discussions about this and arguing, arguing (laughs) that pizza is a vegetable. I am not making this up. The French fries should be left on the school menu because it's a vegetable. Oh, you know, and, and when you try to have these conversations because you have such powerful lobbying groups and conglomerates, mm-hmm. especially the sugar industry that's mm-hmm. making billions of dollars. But I will tell you, and Stephanie, I agree with you, but I will tell you the most powerful way to make this change. And you and she kind of hit it in there. Uh, the most viable group of consumers in the entire world, we're talking the universe as we know it, the most powerful group in the world are women. Women. We are the biggest consumers in the world. So you remember many, many years ago, you couldn't get an organic apple because they were so darn expensive. Well, as we all began buying more organic, they had to stock more organic. Do you know, Sonia, if they removed most of the food in the grocery store that's not real food, only about 20% of the items would be left in the grocery store. Wow. So by shopping the parameters, by buying healthier foods, by reading those labels like you talked about, the only way this is going to change is if you and I and every woman in the world, especially in the U.S., mm-hmm. basically say, you know what, we're not eating this. We're not feeding it to our families. You either give us healthier options or it's going to sit on the shelf. Right. That's when it's going to change because it's all about the money. Absolutely. Pure and simple. It's always about the money. So with the grocery stores, with the fast food industry, with the food industry, food manufacturers, if we're not buying it and they're not making money, it's supply and demand. If we demand, they will do it. And Stephanie, you're right. Legislators need to be educated, but honestly, they know better. They just don't want to do it because they get donations from those groups and they want the money. Well, okay, I'm going to get off my soapbox on that one. But yes, we know. They, they, they've heard from me before. Oh, my goodness. Well, we are almost out of time. Uh, any last questions? I'm going to check over here on Facebook Live. I don't see anything there. Thanks to everybody who joined us on Facebook Live. Uh, for all of you who've been here with us on the Zoom call, 
Great information, Sonia. I really appreciate it. It's it's such a timely, timely conversation, and we're going to edit this down and put it on our YouTube channel so that um, it can be live there. People can watch this on the replay on our social media channel. So if there are no other questions, do you have anything you want to say in closing? Um, I just want to thank everyone again. I want to give a special shout out to um, my chapter president, Dr. Marilyn Martin, um, for supporting and bringing SARS with her. That truly warms my heart. And thank you to um, Tammy Woods, who is the president of Piedmont Black Nurses um, Association as well. Um, thank you for your support. And I appreciate each and every one of you. And I hope that this um, gives you some insight on how we as women can do better for ourselves and, and improve our health. Thank you so much. We appreciate everybody who, who joined us. And uh, that's going to close us out for this program. Uh, don't forget to visit us at the hearttoheartfoundation.org. For those of you that are still here on our Zoom call in the chat, I posted a very special handout on uh, managing blood pressure. There's more resources on our website, of course, and I'm going to post this over on the Facebook page as soon as I hop off here. Um, and always, I like to close with this little reminder that the better you love your heart, the longer it can love you back. Happy Heart Month, everybody. Good night. <laughs>